right? It's being recorded. Okay. Well, I've been playing this game with microwaves and ham radio now for pretty much ever since I graduated in 68. At that time, we were more interested in VHF and UHF, but uh, soon thereafter, it became evident that if we wanted to win radio contests, VHF contests, uh, it would be highly desirable to uh, get up on the higher frequency bands for a number of reasons. Mainly, it made the score go up quicker than in most any other way. And uh, hence, uh, the motivation. But even without that motivation, microwaves are a very interesting situation and as time goes on, uh, it becomes more and more common in our life. Uh, every time we pull one of these things out and start using it, uh, you could argue you're using a microwave frequency. In fact, many of the channels that are now available on your cell phone are in fact in the microwave region above one gigahertz. Um, the original cell band was down in the 800 megahertz range, but now all kinds of different frequencies are being used for cell service. And hence, if you say, well, I'm not interested in microwave, well, A, you've cooked with it, and B, you talk with it, and uh, so it's pretty much in our lives. And not only do you talk with it, but it's also your Wi-Fi interconnect be between your, your laptop or your cell phone into the network. That's all going on in the microwave frequency range. So anyway, uh, when it comes to ham radio, we generally like to use communications to communicate with somebody or talk with them or at least send messages back and forth. And here are a couple of pictures of some of the people who have set up their cars so that they can do this in a, in a ra rather serious way. Um, we'll learn a little bit more as we go forward. Let's see if I can figure out how this works. Okay, well first of all, what do we mean by microwaves in any case? Um, we've got an awful lot of frequencies. Uh, ham radio operators have little bits of spectrum here, there, and everywhere, as you probably know at this point, because many of you have been licensed. Um, they range from frequencies lower than 500 kilohertz, that's below the AM broadcast band, and it runs all the way up into the visible light, and for that matter, there's no limit, at least not as far as the law is concerned. We can use any frequency we want above 275 gigahertz. So all the light frequencies and X-ray, et cetera, in the radio spectrum go way up beyond that. Most people are familiar with the word shortwave and you have kind of a gut feel for what that means. Uh, how many of you have heard, of, before you've even become interested in the ham radio, have you heard about people say, well, there's some guy down the street and he has a shortwave radio. Ever heard that expression? Well, okay, we've got a couple of people. Um, what those people were saying is uh, they were acquainted with this situation where they could listen to radio broadcasts in the HF radio spectrum, usually between uh, 3 and 30 megahertz. And that to them was short wave. And there is some history behind that. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, but when radio first began being used as a communications media, what frequency do you suppose they were using? Any answers? Yes? 300 kilohertz? Not far off. That's about right. Early on, Marconi, yeah. The energy that he was sending out was down in the hundreds or even tens of kilohertz. They were using very, very low frequencies as we look at them today. And the reason was, it's all that he could generate in those days with spark transmitters and similar devices. And so, in those days, 
the experimental ham radio operators were relegated to wavelengths they're much too short for real communications. That really means frequencies higher than we're using for radio communications now. And so, lo and behold, they said, ah, you guys can have anything below 200 meters. Well, that's around one or two megahertz, <laughs> or higher than one or two megahertz in frequency, okay? So the bottom line is, in the early part of the 20th century, ham radio uh, started playing around with frequencies in what we now call the HF spectrum, the high frequency spectrum above three megahertz. And lo and behold, they discovered a phenomenon that the original uh, purveyors of radio communications didn't know about. And that was, they stumbled across the fact that those frequencies propagated very well using the ionosphere. And they had no idea what that was all about early on. We didn't really know what was going on either, ham radio operators, we just played around and used it. And discovered that, oh my gosh, it really does work and it goes a heck of a long ways without a lot of power. So in any case, ham radio operators pioneered the push upward in frequency or down in wavelength. And you might want to read 200 meters and down. I'm sure you can find it if you get on the internet. So for some formal definitions about uh, frequencies and such. Uh, medium frequencies are 0.3 to 3 megahertz. High frequencies, which include the the AM broadcast band, I'm sorry, the medium frequency uh, range includes the, uh, broad, the AM broadcast band, which is from 550 kilohertz to about 1650 or 1700, depending who's talking about it. Uh, above that is the high frequency range, which we've already talked about as being something that can actually use the ionosphere from three to 30 megs. And then there's VHF 30 to 300, where we have two meter repeaters and uh, uh, 50 megahertz uh, ham band. UHF frequencies are 300 to 3000. SHF three gigahertz, which is the same as 3000 megahertz, of course, from three to 30 gigahertz. And there are further uh, definitions, if you care to, to know about them, but at this point, who cares? <laughs> it's just a name anyway. In any case, common usage tends to blur the, the boundaries of these, uh, these ranges. And so some people might call our 225 megahertz ham radio band part of the UHF spectrum. It isn't really, but it's a convenient place to put it. So what do we have for ham radio bands? I don't know if any of you have ever looked carefully at one of those diagrams that can easily take up a 11 by 17 sheet. And lo and behold, we've got a whole bunch of bands and many of them are pretty small, just sandwiched in between other frequency bands that are used for commercial purposes or broadcasting or whatever. And so there's no real point in my talking about this particularly much, except to point out that, let's see if I can get the pointer to go here. Come on, Mr. Pointer, where are you? I'm not, ah, there it is. Okay, on the right-hand side, um, we see the bold uh, type that I put up there. And those frequencies are commonly considered by ham radio operators, microwave frequencies. Other people who work in the art may or may not set the boundary at a gigahertz or so, but if you were to tell them that, yeah, at 1200, I think, uh, I think I'm, a, I'm working a microwave band, and okay, they probably accept that, even if it doesn't fit any particular definition. In any case, 
I'm going to be speaking most about the uh, bands that are in the highlighted section of this chart. And it turns out that these are uh, partly in the UHF band and partly in the SHF band. Uh, but what's interesting about all these frequencies is that they are quite usable from a hardware perspective and also from a propagation perspective. We'll talk about that more as we move on. By the way, if any of you have a comment or question as we go through this, don't be shy. Just say, you idiot, you screwed up. <laughs> okay, so if we look at how much spectrum we have in all these various bands, uh, the vast majority of ham radio operators operate below 30 megahertz. We only have 3.8 megahertz cumulative on all the bands that are below 30 megahertz, which isn't very much. By comparison, VHF, we have 11 megahertz, UHF 116, the mid microwaves almost a gigahertz, and the high microwaves, which are distinguished mainly because they are difficult to use and also that propagation becomes more difficult at those frequencies. But be that as it may, we have over five gigahertz there. And of course, if we go to the really exotic frequencies that are above 81 gigahertz, there's a huge amount of bandwidth that we have because anything above 275 gigahertz is ours to use as we please. And for that matter, it's unlicensed, so it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a ham to use it. Um, but when you're looking at frequencies at that height, you wouldn't think about them in the same fashion as we would about frequencies below 30 megahertz because the same techniques don't apply. But they do apply pretty, pretty well all the way up through uh, five gigahertz, even 10 gigahertz. Meaning by that, yes, you can transmit a single sideband signal on 10 gigahertz, and with the right kind of equipment, it'll sound just fine. It won't be garbled. It won't be drifting. It's all a matter of building the equipment right. But you can, in fact, use it at very, very high frequencies like 10 gigahertz, where the fraction of the... Yes? Um, I'm like amateur with this radio stuff, but are you... So these higher level of um, frequencies, is it, are they more advantageous just because they can carry more like information? They are, they are advantageous for that purpose because to carry more information, you generally need more bandwidth. And as you can see, we have a large amount of bandwidth here. And then with like, what do you mean including light? Like, I don't know, maybe I'm just unfamiliar with the terminology. Like, what do you mean by that? By what? Like, it says above 81 gigahertz, including light, like so, well, light is an electromagnetic wave. So are radio waves. They're the same animal. It's just a matter of the frequency. So a light wave is absolutely identical to an 81 gigahertz radio wave in its basic properties. It propagates the same way. It may not be interacting with the medium that it's in, like the air or wherever it is, uh, the same way because that relates to what's in the air and what the frequency of the radio wave is. There are situations where, for example, the air has oxygen in it. The oxygen molecule actually resonates at 60 gigahertz physically. And so what that then means, if you try to send a radio wave at 60 gigahertz through air that has oxygen in it, it doesn't go very far because it's absorbed as it goes through. The same thing would, uh, would, uh, would apply to light trying to go through clouds, obviously. You have stuff in the way. And so there are different ways that these electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves propagate as a result of what's part and parcel of the medium that you're sending them through, typically air, but not universally air. For example, there's nothing wrong at all with using a 60 gigahertz link to connect two satellites that are beyond the atmosphere where there's no oxygen. In fact, 
it's highly desirable if you want no one to be able to hear you. So it would be a way of clandestinely communicating from satellite to satellite where a ground station could not, by any means whatsoever, learn what's happening upstairs. Guess what might use that? The military people might use that for that reason. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we've already touched on this already. Why all those bands? Well, mainly because the radio wave propagates differently at the different frequencies. It interacts with the medium, i.e. the air or whatever. HF and below, there is significant interaction between the ionospheric layer that is above the troposphere and above that point, at VHF and above, that interaction between the ionosphere and the radio wave becomes muted and less and less important as you go higher and higher. And hence, that is uh, one of the reasons that certain things occur as propagation is concerned. For example, on HF, if you want to communicate a long ways uh, between 3 and 30 megahertz, you choose the right time of day and you get on one of those frequencies that can go from here to Europe or from here to China or for goodness sake anywhere around the world. Choosing an appropriate frequency in that 3 to 30 megahertz range will give you a very large range of communications possibility. You can't do that on, a, on VHF, at least not in a simple way by just using the ionosphere. And then as you go above VHF, all right, now it's pretty much line of sight. But is it really? And can you think of one example where it's not just simple line of sight? FM broadcast. FM broadcast. OK. Another one? Hint, 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 hint. Hint, hint. <laughs> cell phones are not line of sight. I can use this cell phone in here even though I don't see a radio tower. That's not cell phone. That's Wi-Fi. Even if I turn off Wi-Fi, I can still use my cell phone. But you're right. That's another example of a high frequency signal. By the way, what frequency is it on? That's one of them. What's another one? 2.4 and 5 are the most common. But that would be a line of sight, obviously. But on the other hand, I think you'll agree, even if you don't have one of these nearby, uh, you can use your cell phone widely and typically doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference if you're behind a building or not. On the other hand, I'm sure we've all noticed, hey, what in the heck, right here, the cell phone just plain doesn't work and there's not a darn thing I can do about it. Drive down the street a few, a few hundred feet or a mile or two and all of a sudden it works again. What's going on? We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. So some pre quick propagation notes, kind of summarizing. Below a half a megahertz, the ionosphere always reflects day, night, doesn't matter. By the way, Here's an interesting aside. Why is the very, very low frequency range, like below 500 kilohertz, or in this case, the first line here, 0.5 megahertz, what might that be interestingly useful for? It's there all the time. Yes, you had? Uh, submarine communication. They yes. They penetrate water better. Right. It, it, it can be used for submar submarine communication, literally into the ocean. If you have a submarine, it does not have to surface, but it can't be terribly deep either. <laughs> On the other hand, surfacing is bad news as far as a submarine is concerned. 
because it's so much more easily detected above the water than below. So yes, you can communicate directly with submarines. Not only that, VLF, visualize the Earth's globe, and then you have a surface around the globe at the height of the ionosphere, all the way around it, another sphere. And it's made up of charged particles. And as we see here, it says that it is reflective in this range of the frequency. So all you have to do is to start a radio wave somewhere on the Earth's surface, and it will propagate all over the entire world, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, but the amount of messaging that occurs is pretty minimal because the bandwidth available is not very large. On the other hand, if you're trying to tell a submarine, launch the doomsday missile with an atomic warhead, you're pretty much guaranteed you can get it through the message. And that's one of the things that you kind of have. That's why people who've got nuclear capability generally don't use it because somebody else can kill them one way or another. Okay, so below five megahertz, the uh, good example would be the AM broadcast band. It's useful locally during the day, but you can't get a signal from very far away during the day. On the other hand, at night, all of a sudden, you can have great, uh, much longer ranges of communications. Instead of tens of miles to maybe 100 miles or more, you can now have 1,000 miles of communications on the AM broadcast map band uh, at night. This is pretty much similar to the uh, uh, lower frequencies in the ham radio spectrum, like uh, 1.8 megahertz and 3.5 megahertz. Uh, those frequencies uh, are kind of muted in the daytime because of the absorption, but at nighttime, again, they can go much further. On the other hand, when you get above five megahertz, all of a sudden, the HF spectrum begins to become a wonderful daytime medium. And you can, in the upper frequency uh, of that uh, situation depends on uh, a lot of details as to just how highly ionized the atmosphere is. But it's not unusual on 14 megahertz to just jump on the radio and talk to anyone all the way around the world, which is kind of cool. Now, as we get above that, above 20 to 30 megahertz, the ionosphere reflects only occasionally. It, for example, when you have a situation known as a sporadic E layer appear in the ionosphere, the ionosphere is made up of a number of layers. D, E, and F are the most common ones. D is the lowest one which dissipates at night but absorbs during the day on the lower frequency. That's the one closest in. The E layer is next, and beyond that, the F layer. And it's divided into F1 and F2. We won't belabor that fact, but that those layers are commonly used for long distance communications in the middle of the HF band. So the bottom line is that the ionosphere helps in the HF frequency range, and then peters out as you begin to get close to 30 megahertz, except for occasional spurts of enough ionization to allow communications, even on rare occasions as high as 150 megahertz. Not common, but does happen. By the way, there's a similarly allied communications mode. Anybody remember hearing about it? What else is ionized? Oh, that's I'm not what I was thinking about. That's not stuff. What did what did you were thinking? I was thinking trombodesting when you said simulated scratch. I'm sorry, didn't hear. Trombodesting. I thought you meant simulated no, scratching, no. but that's not. I was I was uh, specifically thinking about aurora, aurora borealis, northern lights. That's a charged layer in the atmosphere. And guess what? If there's an aurora north of Canada, and you're on six meters, 50 megahertz, everybody point their antennas north. Eek, eek. You can talk a thousand miles. 
by bouncing it off the auroral curtain, which is kind of in the ionosphere. I'm not even sure how high that curtain goes or where it actually lives. I should look it up sometime. <laughs> so is it all the way to outer space? Um, until there is no ionized particles. Right, yeah. But it's very interesting. You know that I participate in these radio contests up on Mount Greylock. Some of you have been there. Well, we had some RPI students there, fairly new at radio, and a group of the uh, more seasoned operators were having dinner in the lodge. And so one of the guys that was operating outside comes running in. He says, I don't know what, what happened. I, I, can't I can't figure it out. I keep pointing my antenna and I can't talk to anybody except when I'm pointing north. Not only that, they're whispering instead of talking. In other words, it's sound like this. It's not normal talk. And what's happening is the auroral curtain is so agitated that the radio waves that reflect from it are dispersed in frequency. And so a single tone doesn't sound like a tone when it comes back. It sounds like a hiss that is centered around that tone. In other words, instead of not being a nice pure beep, and whoosh, it's kind of a hiss that has a center frequency. So it, if you're sending Morse code, it sounds like instead of the tone but the same symbol. So that's a clear way that you can say, hey, that's Aurora. Yes? But we do contests in June and September, right? Aurora yes. Aurora is the last comment of those contests. That may be, but it does happen. Okay. All right. More propagation notes. Above 100 megahertz, the troposphere begins to get important. There's a, you, get, you can get enhanced uh, propagation by making use of boundary layers. One thing that can happen is in a very still atmosphere, when there is an approaching cold front that has been blocked by a large high pressure, or something like that, and the weather system just slow down to a crawl, now you can get layering in that atmosphere. And all of a sudden, you can get radio waves that will propagate along a layer or maybe even between layers, known as a duct. And the radio wave goes up into the duct, bounce, 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 and could go a thousand miles before it's heard at the other end. And so that is very, very exciting. When at a frequency where you expect to be able to talk maybe 100 or 200 miles, you're actually talking to Florida when you're in Massachusetts. And I can remember doing that during one contest. It lasted the entire contest. Unbelievable. And it was loud, too. <laughs> it wasn't just puny weak. So we have boundary layer effects. Then we can have scattering due to variable water concentration. And we'll talk more about that rarely going on. And then these these effects rarely interrupt communications. They typically enhance it, but what you normally will find there is usually still there. Between 100 megahertz and 20 gigahertz is known as the atmospheric window. And that is because at 100 megahertz, the ionosphere isn't much of a problem in terms of wanting to go through it. So if you want to communicate with a deep space object like the moon, it better be above 100 and probably wants to be less than 20 gigahertz because above 20 gigahertz there are places where there is absorption in the atmosphere from molecules such as water vapor or oxygen. So you definitely need to avoid those. So we speak about, okay, dominant, a dominant mode of propagation above uh, the lower frequencies when you start to talk microwave is uh, straight free space path loss. We've all heard, probably most of us at least, have heard about that signals diminishes one over R squared. 
Does that make sense to everyone here? Do you know why that is? It's the spherical geometry. Yes, it's the spherical geometry. If you're squirting energy in a certain direction and it's filling up a sphere that's increasingly larger and larger, as you get further and further away, the density of the energy goes down as the square because of the area of the sphere. That's a simple way of remembering it. And so it goes over, it goes, it gets smaller as one over r squared. If we use the terms in dB, because it's convenient, because we use very large numbers here, uh, that's the formula. By the way, isotropic antennas are simply antennas that are a point source that's spread out everywhere in all directions equally. That's what that means. And the rest of it is the simple arithmetic. Now, we use that formula in writing what you might want to call a power budget, where you try to figure out how much signal is going to get from where you are to where you're going. And the underlying uh, equation in this whole game is this free space path loss, which is right here about a third of the way up from the bottom. Uh, isotropic to isotropic antennas for a 70 mile path is 140 dB. That's a lot of dB. When you think 10 dB is one tenth the power, okay, 100 dB, ooh, 140 dB? That's 10 to the 14th. And that's why we use dB, because it gets completely incredible to try to use ordinary arithmetic. So lots of orders of magnitude. Radio communications is one of those things in science where we routinely deal with very, very large numbers of orders of magnitude. Obviously, the size of objects is another one where if you go from the size of an atom to the size of the universe, you've got a huge, large span, and hence it's all scientific notation. Nothing else would work. So the bottom line is you can use that free space formula that we just saw and then start out with things such as, OK, I have this much transmit power. And we're going to express that in the form of a, a decibel. And then we're going to add and subtract things like the feed line loss between the transmitter and the antenna, or maybe the antenna gain. Uh, and then the path loss at a certain length. When you get all done, you can calculate, at, as you see in the bottom line here, what is the strength of the signal at the far end of the path? And in this particular example, it's minus 102.5 dBm. Now, OK, so what? Can a receiver hear that? And the answer is yes. A receiver noise calculation can tell you how much noise the receiver will see, in effect, in order to try to receive this, if it has a 3 dB noise figure. It's the equivalent noise at the antenna input is then minus 129 dB. That compared with the signal of minus 102.5, guess what? You're positive. You're positive by 26.7 dB. And so yes, you can communicate if you need a minimum of 5 dB in order to decode that signal and actually hear it. That means you have 21.7 dB to spare in this particular example. By the way, this is a realistic example. These are not numbers just pulled out of a hat. This is a realistic example for a station on what band did I choose? Let's see, at 2300 megahertz. And the station uses 50 milliwatts, as you see on line number two. And it communicates with the station at the other end that has a low gain antenna, like maybe on Mount Greylock, because I want to be able to hear all the people from various directions rather than just from one direction. So if I have a low gain antenna at that end, but with a reasonably high gain antenna on the distant end, 
I still have enough gain in the two antennas to make it work. So the bottom line is you can literally figure out whether or not a particular path works or not. This is a simple line of sight path, not considering any wild mechanisms of propagation. We'll get into those next. Making sense so far? Yes. By complicated, you mean a tree in a way. Say what? By complicated propagation, you mean a tree that's growing in your way. Well, that's one complication, but I'm speaking about the basic means of communications. The tropos scatter is not simple by comparison. So what about beyond line of sight? Ionospheric effects are rare, above 150 megahertz. Aurora, as we mentioned, it's possible. I've heard it on 432 megahertz, but only once in my life, so it is rare indeed. Uh, knife edge diffraction, what does that mean? Well, if you have a light experiment and you have a very sharp knife edge, have you ever seen uh, or read in physics books that when you shine that light on that sharp edge, you will see all kinds of weird things on the other side of the sharp edge, like an interference pattern? As the radio wave diffract, I'm sorry, as the electromagnetic wave, in this case light, diffracts over that sharp edge, or the two hole experiment, that's also a diffraction that's going on. Bottom line is that from a simple point of view, if there's a mountain in the way, you hit it at the top and you're trying to talk to somebody down there, you can't talk to that person down below but that's not really true. You might be able to talk to that person down below because of the diffraction that occurs because of the ridge that's up on top. Now, does anyone have an idea of why this mechanism actually works from a physical point of view? Let me give you a possibility. Radio waves when they impact on something, what happens? Electrical signals begin to flow in that object if they're at all conductive. If these radio waves cause a signal to flow, even though weakly, you know, I don't know, pick something, tree branches, any other object, a little bit of electricity goes back and forth at the frequency of the radio wave in these objects that are populating the top of this ridge. Guess what? Because those things are actually real electrical signals vibrating back and forth in conductors, albeit they poor conductors, they're going to radiate. Anything that, any, any signal that's actually vibrating or flowing at a, at a radio rate will radiate. So that's one means that you can look at it and say, okay, physically, all right, we radiate the top of the mountain. The mountain goes up there, but also, you know, has currents flowing in it. Therefore, it will radiate. And if it's not too far away, I might be able to talk to somebody in the valley. That's knife edge diffraction. Reflection or diffraction about mirror objects. Guess what? Every time you pick up a cell phone, you're doing that. You're not seeing a cell tower most of the time. The vast majority of the time, you're behind something. So what's happening? Bouncing off the tree, you're hearing a reflected signal. But diffracting off the edge of that building, you're hearing a diffracted signal. All kinds of schmush is going on. And guess what? Those signals are arriving at your cell phone at all different times. And there's something called an equalizer in that cell phone that sorts all that mess out and gets you a signal that actually works. And that's not a trivial mathematical game. I think Heisen is shaking his head. Yes, I know. <laughs> I had that experience with my setup. Have you ever, have you ever, I have never done so. Have you ever looked at the mathematics of this equalizer? Um, no, not really. Okay, well, it's, it can be daunting. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but they're in here in the processors in your phone. That's cool. All right. 
So diffractions, it's a, it's a very short range phenomenon in terms of cell phones. And then there's tropospheric scatter. Tropospheric scatter is basically using the atmosphere as a jumbled up mess to your advantage. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Then there's tropospheric bending and ducting. We've talked about that already a little bit. That can be, uh, but, it, but it's only on rare occasions. Now here's one that might make you smile. You can use, you can use rain the same way as you can use um, the edge of a mountain except at a much, much higher frequency to where the wavelength is smaller. Now, what happens there? You've got a raindrop. It's being illuminated by, pick a number, uh, 10 gigahertz, and you're creating a little bit of uh, electrical energy to flow in that raindrop, and it's re-radiating. Now, not only that, but because in a rainstorm, raindrops don't all fall at the same rate. Some are small, some are large. And so some will fall rapidly, some will fall more slowly, and it takes that nice signal that might be a tone when you send it and jumbles it up much like, what else did we just talk about? Aurora. Aurora. So rain scatter on 10 gigahertz sounds eerily similar to Aurora on 144 megahertz. It's all a matter of the frequency and the size of the things that it's interacting with. And then we have the uh, uh, we have the mode of communications that is probably the natural mode of communications. It's probably the uh, shall we say the thing that you can always depend on. That is, okay, if all else fails, I'll just send a signal to the moon, bounce it off to the moon, and uh, the guy on the other side of the world can hear me. What's the problem with that? The moon's not on the other side of the world. What's that? The moon's not on the other side of the world. Yep. So you're going to see it half the time. Not only that, but the person that you're trying to talk to also has to be able to see the moon at the same time. So if he's on exactly the opposite side of the world, I mean exactly, you can't talk to him. If he's not exactly at the other side of the world, but he's offset a moderate amount, you can talk to him, but only for a short while. So if you're trying to talk to China, Tyson, you might not have a large window. <laughs> we did that calculation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we did that. that. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out that it would have been possible. But there are, there are places that are precisely opposite you on the world. And if you think about the geometry, okay, the moon's up here and you're on either side of the world, you're trying to point at it. Well, if you're exactly, there's gonna be trees and mountains and mountains in the way and that sort of thing. Okay, so beyond line of sight, there really are a number of ways to communicate. We'll talk about tropospheric scatter now. It gives you a moderate to substantial range enhancement. By that I mean, uh, if you're thinking about line of sight, uh, you, from a good mountaintop, you might be able to do 50 miles, 60, 70 miles maybe, like Mount Greylock, not a problem at all. Certain directions you get 100 miles. But sooner or later, the curvature of the earth will do you in. Okay, it's, it's a problem, but if we've got a troposphere, maybe there's something in the atmosphere that we can use and bounce off of it or refract off of it. It turns out that there is, and what's interesting about it is it's extremely reliable in the sense that it doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter if there's a thunderstorm. In fact, it might help. It doesn't matter if there's a nuclear attack, it still works. Because there's always something in the troposphere that's boiling and moving and, heck, if you've got a major disruption of some sort, like a well, hurricane or goodness the Lord knows what, there's always gonna be something 
that is diffracted forward and you'll be able to make a link. This has been exploited, uh, shall we say, with malice and forethought by the military since the 1950s. They discovered it probably by accident and said, oh, this is interesting. And by, they started taking measurements and that's cool. The, con the variable fluctuations of water vapor concentration in the troposphere are always there. You can convince yourself of this. If you look up on a day when it's partly cloudy, why is it partly cloudy? Well, there's more water vapor here than it is there. It varies. But even when it's a clear day, although the water vapor concentrations are lower and therefore it's clear, they haven't precipitated into little droplets making clouds, but the water vapor concentration is still variable ad hoc, randomly in the air. And so we make use of those fluctuations in troposcattered communications because they're always present. Uh, W3SZ, who is an alumnus, you might have guessed, <laughs> uh, has a wonderful research. Uh, I mean, great source of research on his website. If you want to read all the details of all the studies that have been done about this propagation mode, that's a good place to find it. So here's a troposcatter diagram. Now, the first thing that you uh, must realize while looking at this diagram, it's great as a diagram, but it doesn't does not resemble the real world by world by any stretch of the imagination. That angle that you see there is nowhere near as large as, it, as you see it depicted. It's actually only on the order of a few degrees, maybe a degree or two. So this whole picture is much more flat than you see, but it was shown in this way so that you can easily pick out what's important. And so if you look at this, you will see that what's most important are the distances from each end to where their signal will be obstructed by a mountain or something. On each side, you need to know the height of the, uh, of the obstruction and the distance from your transmitter or receiver. And then of course, you need to know the overall length. And from that, using a spherical model for the Earth, you can uh, work out all the angles and figure out what's happening. One way to do, the, do that, uh, that work is to use a piece of bent up uh, plotting paper. And before computers, this was about the only way people could do this work. But you can do this now with computers easily enough. This is a simple elevation profile that is a line of sight path between Mount Greylock on the left and Petersburg Pass about, I don't know, about 13 miles away on the right. And so uh, there's very little earth curvature over a distance of 13 miles, so we can plot it pretty much as a rectangular uh, plot. And guess what? There is a line of sight uh, as shown by the line. On the other hand, if you take this out to about 281 kilometers, which is approximately Watertown, New York from uh, Mount Greylock. Now the story is quite different. And again, the, uh, the drawing looks, looks like it's way, way, way more than it really is in real life. You still only have a couple of degrees of intersection. But the two circled objects on the graph are the places where the radio wave is obstructed from each side of the path. And in some cases, it's a long ways away, like if you're up high on Lake Mount Greylock. So you see that that's nearly at the middle of the path. Whereas on the uh, Watertown area at Woodard Road and here, the obstruction is relatively close uh, to the end of the path. Doesn't matter, what matters is the intersection angle that is shown at the top of the graph, again, much smaller than you see depicted. You can stick it into a worksheet and do the mathematics that way, 
and take information off of a uh, topographic map or an electronic mapping program. In any case, you need those four variables that we were seeing on the graph. If you do that, and you stick it into a uh, Toposcatter calculator program, you can, actually, you can actually figure out whether or not you got a path between you and the other end. And this takes into account the, the scattering loss, depends, which depends on the angle that they, those two vectors cross, the scattering loss caused by that, and just the, the, the ordinary uh, line of sight loss because of distance. And you, com you combine those two amounts and you figure out, okay, what's the loss? And this program does that. But what I'm saying is, guess what? You can actually predict whether or not the link works. Turns out that there are a number of people who worked in this field, uh, and they are shown below at the bottom of the screen, and you see that, they're, that the results that they show for the signal strength is moderately variable, except for that guy on the far right named Ryder. Um, he's just out in the left field compared to everybody else. But it kind of indicates that this is not an exact science, mainly because the diffraction mode or the mechanism that's going on in the atmosphere is not very exact. Hence, the, the variability of your answers um, are going to vary. <laughs> okay, so bottom line is you can actually figure out what tropospheric uh, scatter path loss is. You can then decide whether or not you can actually try to make the contact. And there's one other thing that I might add. When I talked with W3SZ, he was talking to me about something else. Using aircraft actively, meaning intentionally figuring out when aircraft are going to be halfway between you and the other end of the path, and then sending your signal at that point, and using the aircraft by accident just as a scattering object halfway between. It works, and it works quite well. The aircraft doesn't care, your signal is tiny. And lo and behold, you can actually hear that signal when the aircraft comes through your path, all of a sudden, the signal builds up, you can make the contact, and maybe 10, 20 seconds later, it disappears, you've made the contact, the aircraft is gone, everybody's happy. <laughs> so he wrote a program that figured out where were all the aircraft in the air, when they went through a certain place in the air, because that information is publicly available. And lo and behold, you can use aircraft scatter as another means of extending the range in the, in the microwave frequency range. So how can you far, how far can you talk anyway? These graphs, graphs come from our operation on Mount Greylock in June 2004. But they're typical of the ranges that you can do any time. The first two graphs are on 1296 megahertz and 2304 megahertz. You notice an interesting thing here? It's twice the frequency, approximately. But what? The range is about the same. Interesting, isn't it? But it's supposed to be a lot less. No. I'll get back to you on that. The answer is no. Here's 3456, 5760. The range is a little less, but not a lot. So what's going on? We looked at that path loss equation way back when. And it said that there was a frequency term in this equation. And it was 20 log f. What? How come the range isn't decreasing? Well, here's the secret. If you look at the second part of that problem, first of all, you figure out what the free space path loss is from an isotropic 
radiator to an isotropic receiver. That's stage one. The next thing you do is you say, okay, I'm now going to add antennas. I'm gonna use an antenna on one end, it's a dish. I'm gonna use an antenna on the other hand, it's a dish. In the microwave frame, typically you would use a dish. What's the gain of a dish? 20 log D on each end. In other words, the diameter of the dish is related by a 20 log term to the gain. So you don't have just one dish, but two dishes that are going up as 20 log D. Oops, okay. Now I understand, in fact, if you have, and this is not, this is counterintuitive, if you are using two stations that use the same size antenna, not isotropic antenna, same size antenna, and you jack up the receiver, I'm sorry, the, you jack up the, uh, the frequency by a factor of two, path loss goes up by a factor of six, this antenna goes up six dB, that antenna goes up six dB, guess what? The signal strength increases six dB as you raise the frequency by a factor of two. So that's completely counterintuitive. Why? Because first of all, if I have a big antenna, it's hard to point. And if it's hard to point, I'm not as likely to use a big antenna because I can't do it, all right? But if you are skillful enough to make darn sure you point it right, you can make the link work. So that's one thing. Second thing is, even though we now know pretty much how to build uh, the electronics for both ends of these paths pretty, pretty well, it's still harder to build uh, really good equipment for higher frequencies than it is for lower frequencies. So in general, you will likely have less power or poorer sensitivity at the higher frequency. So that's where the gut feel comes from. Oh, couldn't possibly be true. But if you do same aperture size type comparisons, that is in fact what happens, the signal strength actually rises, not decreases. And hence, that's completely beyond most people's experience because of the secondary effects. So here are some pictures. This is the guy who really went nuts. <laughs> Station wagon with a six foot dish. And he could fold that thing down and drive down the road at 60 miles an hour after, dis, after disassembling the feed structure in the middle of the dish, putting it inside the car. <laughs> and the dish pointing straight up in the air from the roof. So that was Tim. And um, his maximum range was 353 miles on one occasion when he had some good propagation conditions. This is the equipment rack inside of his uh, of his van, not trivial. There's another van, not not quite as uh, heavily equipped as the first one. Uh, this this fellow uh, routinely went to Maine, and we talked to him from the number of grids there on all bands through 10 gigahertz. Uh, you notice there's a number of antennas here that are Yagi's, and they're not microwave, or at least. We don't typically call them microwave. And that's because the VHF contest includes frequencies from 30 megahertz up. And so they go out with microwave equipment, but also with VHF equipment and UHF equipment. And here is a, a piece of homegrown, uh, uh, very basic microwave rover station for a number of different frequencies. We made seven of these boxes about 30 years ago and used them for a number of years. Yes? I think I've seen one as news 
meeting at some point. What's that? I've seen one of these. Yes. At the news meeting. Yes. Yes. And uh, on the on the left here, there is a, a band module that works with that with that wooden box for five gigahertz. And then on the lower right, there's a 144 to 1296 transverter that again was made all at W2SZ. We built a lot of these things, all of our, all our own. So, in conclusion, we have tons of microwave spectrum available, way, way, way more than is obviously usable to us. So, we really ought to get out there and start using it. If you got an idea of using it for high-speed data links, great. If you've got any other idea for whatever you might be interested in, by all means, go for it. Use those frequencies for anything and everything that you can imagine. One of the things is you can experiment with long-haul communications, as I have been doing for decades of my life. It's fun. It's, it gets me to, to drive all over the Northeast. In fact, this past weekend, I was down in the Washington, D.C. area looking at some rover sites. Why? Because we have a fellow who was a student here almost as long as ago as I was, and he's retiring now, and he's, he lives in California, but he's building a rover station, and he's going to bring it to the East Coast, and he's going to drive around the East Coast to try to talk to Mount Grayla. Why? Because he's nuts, just like the rest of us. <laughs> And one of the places that we might like to suggest he goes is down toward the south. So, great fun. It's very challenging on a number of, there's, there's all kinds of propagation methods. You can play with moon bounce. There's a whole community of people that uh, play the moon bounce game. And now with the digital modes, it's amazing how small a station you can use to adequately do moon bounce, uh, which means basically talk to somebody anywhere in the world, almost. And it can now be a much smaller station than it used to be. I've seen a guy with a four foot dish on 10 gigahertz at the side of his car, pointing at the moon and communicating with a guy in, in Belgium. No big deal. <laughs> really? Yeah. Used to take a, a 10 meter dish to do that in Morse code. Now we use a digital mode and uh, uh, it's about a quarter of the size or less. 10 meter dish, that's ridiculous. That's <laughs> how are you actually going to mount that on the tower? Just one. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Dick, for this wonderful talk. And for, for this is going to be part one of our microwave series. Yes, as you'll notice, the next to the last uh, bullet point on this one says, "Join us next time for information on hardware for the microwave bands. How do you actually build some stuff?" Yes. And so, would you talk about your setup? I might talk about your setup too. Oh yeah. Sure. <laughs> He's got, he, he did it uh, the modern way. Slightly. Yeah, pretty much. I'm looking for new solutions too. Okay, well that's there good. There are SDRs that you can plug in a PCIe slots, so that's in a computer interface, so yeah. that you can use your laptop as an SDR and carry good. it around. Which Those is are expensive though. $700. On like USB-C, because some USB-C has like pass through right to PCIe. That is doable. Yes. Now the dongle that you currently use, uh, isn't there a, down, a, a physical down conversion inside of that before the digitizing? Oh yeah, there they have to be. Yeah, there has to be. Yes. So I'm not sure yeah. what frequency that runs. It is zero. Oh, yeah, that's right. yeah, but the point is, okay, we'll talk later. Huh? Yes, we'll talk later, and I'll stop recording here. But before that, any questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, but we're doing the better. <laughs> hey, to the theory part. My only question is, I want to see the hardware. <laughs> okay, we'll show you some. Yeah. We'll show you some that will bend your ear and maybe make your arms long. <laughs>
Let me put it this way. Uh, about four years ago, I went to the Dayton Ham Radio Convention, which is actually held in Xenia, Ohio these days. But in any case, I walked down an aisleway. This is a large convention that draws maybe 20,000 people. If you can imagine that, a fairgrounds, and a very large flea market, thousands in the flea market. I'm walking down the flea market aisle, and I see this 24-inch rack unit. That is, 24 inches wide. It's about 30 inches deep, and it's about that thick. And three gigahertz amplifier. Oh, hey, what's that? Oh, it's a, an amplifier that we were using to do propagation tests on three gigahertz for cellular. The guy was from Motorola. OK, yeah, not a big surprise. Well, why are you getting rid of it? He says, well, we're done with the tests, and we don't need it anymore. So here it is. You want it? Uh, yeah, how much? Uh, 500. Uh, that's a lot of money. What power does it have? 600 watts. Oh, really? Hmm. What primary power does it use? Uh, 208 volts, single phase. Okay, I can manage that, 208, 220, whatever. That'll do it. Okay. Looking at the back, what's the wave, what's the output? Big ass wave guide coming out the back. This is not a trifling thing. <laughs> okay. So, a couple of interesting things about traveling wave tubes, which is a piece of hardware that has been around ever since World War II. Traveling wave tubes have an interesting attribute. They are a distributed interaction device. That means that there's no one single point that you can say, okay, this is the input, and no one single point where you can say this is the physical output, but rather the structure of the electron tube is a long and continuous structure of a helix wound around an electron beam, which of course the electron beam is in a vacuum, but the helix is not. So anyway, you've got this structure that is an, a long physical interaction, and it has, to, it has the attribute of not being restricted to a single frequency because of its long interaction region, it can be as much as a two or three or even more to one frequency range. So this amplifier that was sitting on the bench went through my mind, if this thing is nominally for three gigahertz, it might very possibly work on two gigahertz and also on five. So I said, tell you what, I'll come back at the end of the uh, at the end of the ham fest, and if you still got it, maybe we can make a deal. So I did that. He came back at the end of the at the end of the flu market, and he had not yet made a deal. So I said, "Okay, I'll give you four for it, not five. He said, "Deal." Hey Brian, I need a hand here. <laughs> it's too heavy for one man. <laughs> oh God, yeah, it was heavy. I don't think I'll bring that. <laughs> but it's somewhere in your garage. It's actually in one of my storage units. Oh. You know my storage units. <laughs> um, but it turns out that you can find things like that. You don't find them immediately when you want them, but you find them as, as you can uh, in various places. For example, a ham radio friend that lives in Canada uh, I've been helping him build microwave equipment, and he would drive around in Canada, and we would talk to him. Okay, that's nice. Calls me up. He says, hey, Dick, I got this friend that I've been talking to up in North Northwest Territories. Uh, okay. He says that they're taking a whole bunch of microwave stations out of, out of uh, service up there and do I want any of the hardware that's coming out? All we have to do is pay for its transportation. 
uh, okay, what's he got? He started talking to us, and the ear went click, traveling wave tube amplifiers, and <laughs> some more traveling wave tubes. This time, not nearly so big as the 600 water, but 80 watts. Still significant amount of power on five gigahertz. And so I said, well, if he's willing to ship them, how much is that gonna cost us? And he said, well, if, if, they, if they do it, catch his catch can instead of, I want it to leave now, whenever there's a shipment back down to the Toronto area, well, we can get uh, five or six of these amplifiers on uh, probably for maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars for six amplifiers. Bill, tell him yes, quickly, before he forgets. <laughs> So sure enough, the amplifiers came down and we tested them. Every one of them worked. They were pulled out of service, had many hours on them, but they still worked. And so you can get hardware like that. And, uh, and then there's the modern stuff. Uh, you can now buy a single device on 10 gigahertz. Yeah, about yay by yay. And if you're careful the way you mount it, and you've got a good circuit board, low loss and all that, that damn thing will do 30 watts in a package that's about like yay, and it's at 10 gigahertz. 30 watts. Only $250 for the device. But a friend of mine decided that he was gonna buy one or two, see if he could make one work. Cross your fingers. <laughs> but. You know, something like that, okay, that means that moon bounce is entirely feasible. At 35 watts, digital modes these days, bounce a signal off the moon with as little as a two meter dish. It's getting to the point where it's pretty amazing. Of course, if, <laughs> and there's uh, several more traveling wave tubes in my basement that used to be used in broadcast service. Uh, broadcast service typically used the four and six gigahertz commercial satellite bands. You transmit at uh, 60, 6300 megahertz and you receive at 3800 megahertz, that sort of thing. So the transmitters were sitting there at um, at 6,800, but they were traveling wave tubes and they are wide bandwidth machines. And so you can find, you can find tubes that way. I've got a couple of them at home, 200 watts each. All you gotta do is make a power supply for them. There's a project. <laughs> completely divorced from, completely divorced from electromagnetics. Or is it? Not really because what you're going to use to make uh, the DC supply that would be needed for something like that would be a DC to DC converter. And there's no way that you would use a big uh, iron transformer anymore. You just do it all with a high frequency transformer operating in tens or hundreds of kilohertz, typically. And you'd make your six kilovolts at uh, half an amp that way. <laughs> so, great fun that you can have. And yes, it could be dangerous. Do not insert foot on half an amp of six kilovolts. You will die. <laughs> yeah, this is like anything else. You can do stupid stuff, and uh, I've did my I've done my share, but. When I get around high voltage that has any kind of kick at all, I get real careful real quick because it can kill you. And the RF can cook you too, so don't get near the feed on a high power transmitter just like Microwave tens of watts or hundreds of watts. Microwave oven to get started. What's that? Microwave oven, yeah, exactly. 2.4 gigs. 2.4 gigs, yeah, 2450 to be precise. We're trying to get one of those in our station, so we got a new radio. 
Yeah, we, the one thing I was looking at is for the roof is one of the, there's an antenna that they make. I don't know, if we'll get them to put this up there, but it's VHF, UHF, and then some of the SHF bands are covered all in one 